Well, good evening. How's everyone doing this evening? Um, as Brother Rick mentioned, uh, we, my wife and I we became grandparents about a year and a half ago. I have my iPad, so I'm going to go ahead and show you some pictures here to get ourselves started. So, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I've got a bunch of pictures of her on here, and my wife's got way, way more than it. And Anne Marie, our daughter-in-law, I mean, her whole phone is nothing but pictures of the beautiful little grandbaby. So Alex and myself, and of course, Lori and Sherry, we kind of have a running battle, I guess, with whose grandchild is, uh, is uh, what's the word? Ours is the precious little girl, so always at the top, right? <laughs> Let me turn it on. What's that? Yeah, they got a little boy, so, uh, okay, I believe that's on there. Let me uh, just mention a couple of things uh, as we get started here. Some of you that are here today, you might uh, not be real familiar with, oh, is that on there? Are we okay there? Might not be familiar with a lot of the things that we, we talk about here when, when we talk about the gospel of the grace of God and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And what uh, those are the basics of what God is doing today. And what we're going to talk about tonight is going to be dealing with, and especially for and to believers, those who have personally trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. So I need to ask you a question tonight before we get started. I don't want to scare anybody off. I want to say everybody's welcome. If you have never personally trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your, your Savior, you don't know what I mean by that. Maybe you've been in churches a lot and organizations. Maybe you walked the aisle, even got baptized and that type of thing. But maybe you've never personally trusted Christ for your Savior. Uh, now it really is a good time to do it um, for a couple of reasons. One is why not now? What, uh, I mean, What's the excuse for not settling the question about your eternal destiny now? Why, why put it off another day? I read about a week ago on the Internet. I forget what, uh, what city or town this happened in, but there was a young couple. They were, I believe, in their, it was in Washington State. I think it was Washington State. There was a young couple. They were in their 20s, I believe. They had a little six-year-old baby. And they were... Uh, actually, they were missionaries for a, pit, for, for a particular church, and they were just driving down the street, minding their own business. And they happened to be driving at the time under an underpass, and it was just a standard bridge, not, you know, just a standard bridge. Cars could go over that type of thing, and they were evidently doing some work up there. And you know those big, I think they're like 2,000-pound concrete barriers that they put up for protection, people don't fall, et cetera, the type of thing. Well, anyway, this couple is driving in their truck, and they j literally, at the split second, as they're passing underneath this bridge, that concrete barrier fell on them and crushed them. They both, all three of them died instantly. Now, how bizarre is that? How way over the top is that? Several years ago in Southern California, there was a guy just minding his own business, walking on the beach. And a plane, a little small plane, guy that only had engine trouble, the engine went out or something like that, and this guy tries to land on the beach. He had lost control of the flaps and, and stuff, and that plane mowed the guy down. He died. The guy's walking on the beach. And he dies. You do not know when your life's going to end. You do not know that. It could end tonight. You understand that? Now, you, you take a moment just to think about how serious that is. It could end tonight. It might not, but it could. And it will someday. So why not take a moment now to think about the claim of the God of the Bible. The God who says he created heaven and earth on purpose and for a purpose. And at the heart of that purpose has to do with the fact that he gave his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to come to this earth and to die on the cross for your sins. For your sins. See, it's one thing 
to believe, like I did for many, many years, that Christ died for the sins of the world. It's easy to keep that at a distance. But the claim of the God of the Bible is that he died for your sins. You personally, the one living in your skin, the one sitting in the seat you're in tonight. And he did that for a couple of reasons. He died for your sins because your sins are real. And because the justice of God must and did deal with those sins when they were placed upon Jesus Christ at the cross. That's how real your sins are. And when Jesus Christ says from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you die with your sins on your soul, even one of them, God will forsake you. His justice demands it, exactly like he did to his son on the cross. He will forsake you, and you will spend eternity in the lake of fire paying for your own sins. You can argue about that. You can disagree with that. It is not going to change the reality of it. It's not. But there's another reason why Christ died for your sins. It has to do with the love of God. Because to the same extent that the justice of God demanded that he pour out his wrath on his only begotten son, his only beloved son, he spared not his own son, to that same extent that the justice of God demanded the full wrath to be poured out, to that exact same extent is how much God loves you. And God says this, because Christ died for your sins and was buried, and he rose again. And God says this. He says, if you'll just believe me, if you'll just take me at my word, you don't have to make a commitment. Don't promise me you'll do better next time. You won't. Even the whole concept of invite Jesus into your heart. No, 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 no. Your heart's evil and desperately wicked. He doesn't ask for your heart. God's the giver. You're not the committer. He says, he says just believe my message. Just, just trust what I'm telling you. And if you'll trust what I'm telling you about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, God says, on the integrity of his own heart, he says, I will save you right now. And I'll keep you saved forever. Amen. That's good news. Amen. Best news you'll ever hear. Why not trust that now? In your heart, in your mind, you're arguing with that? Well, it's not really true, but that's just a preacher. No, no, it's true. Why, why not just in the privacy of your heart right now just to say, well, it, you say, well, it can't be that easy. It better be. Those of you here today who think, well, it can't be that easy, what exactly do you plan on adding to it? Your confession, your promise, your prayer, your baptism. Your, are you going to put that on the same level with the blood of Christ and the cross work of Christ? Are you kidding? When Jesus Christ says on the cross, it is finished. Why did he say such a thing? Because it was. The offer is that good. It's that real. And it's the truth. So I invite you, if you're here tonight and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your Savior, do it right now because then the, what the rest I'm going to say in my message, it, it's going to apply to you now. <laughs> for everyone else here, you have trusted Christ for your salvation. But I don't know everyone here. I, I don't know exactly where you are in your understanding of the Word of God rightly divided. I don't know exactly where you are in your understanding of what Paul calls my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the Revelation mystery. So I'm going to say some things. A lot, most of what I'm going to say has to do with those who have come to understand some things about the unique ministry of the Apostle Paul. So if I say some things that you don't quite understand about that and you are a believer, that's okay. Don't, don't get upset. Just 
Go back, re-listen to the message, find out, find out what we're talking, find out what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he uses the phrases, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the Revelation mystery. Take the time and find that out. It's right out of your Bible, Romans chapter 16 and several other passages. Take the time to go find out what that means. It's that important. And when we talk about this really being a, a ministry conference to ministers and to you have your ministry and so forth. You got to know what that information is. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. I'm going to have you open your Bibles. By the way, all that's kind of just introduction. That wasn't my message. Is that okay? So that means I can start now, right? So that means you're not going to hold the clock against me, right? We do want to, as the brothers have mentioned, certainly do remember to keep in prayer. Uh, Dean and, and David and many others that have serious health issues right now. A lot, lot of them, maybe they're not mentioned by name, but you know them. They're part of your ministry. And do remember them before the Lord by name. A lot of misunderstanding about the grace message has to do with, is God intervening today? And why pray if God is not going to heal them? You ever hear questions like that? I submit to you that God is intervening today. Absolutely, He's intervening. How did you get saved? I, I just told you about that if you trust Christ, God would save you. That's intervention. My gosh, you trust Christ. He changes your eternal destiny from hell to heaven. He takes you out of Adam, places you in Christ, blesses you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, makes you complete in Christ, raises you and sets you with Christ in the heavenly places. That's intervention. Some, that took divine, supernatural power. The government do, didn't do that. The city didn't do that. Your husband, your wife didn't do that. And if something as wonderful as the need that was expressed for Brother Dean, and then the saints got together and he took up a collection for him. Why'd you do that? Now I'm asking, why'd you do that? Those of you that gave for Brother Dean, why'd you do that? Did you do it because of a tax write-off? Why'd you do that? Out of love. You know what? That's divine intervention. That is how God intervenes today. God intervenes today in the hearts of the believers when they believe His Word and to make a free will choice to respond to the circumstance that is presented to them. That's divine intervention right there. That's how God intervenes. He's not, he's not manipulating kingdoms, not making presidents and prime ministers rise and fall. That's not how He's working today in the dispensation of grace. But He is very active, very much involved in the life of the believer. Because he's in you. And you're active in the world. Isn't that something? We, my wife and I put together this book. Many of you all have seen it. It's called The Bible, The Big Picture. And it's a simple presentation of rightly dividing the word of truth from a Pauline dispensational perspective. Many of you all have seen that. We've gotten a lot of good feedback on that. The reason I bring it up is I got, I got, we got, my wife and I got a package in the mail. Oh, I guess maybe a month and a half ago now. Open, open this up and everything. And. And it was a book about that size, kind of similar in color and so forth, but it was in tongues or something. I couldn't read it. <laughs> totally different language. And I opened it up and everything, and it kind of looked familiar, but not. And then I looked in the front, and I saw a name there, and it turns out that uh, Jan and Paula Stellman, they took and translated that in Dutch. Isn't that something? Listen, that's divine intervention. God worked in their heart to take some Bible study material. They were able to, obviously, they knew English, they knew their language, and they said, listen, let's take the time to do this. Let's make this available. And then they proceed. They, they took themselves, they, upon themselves the cost, the publication, and everything. God is very much at work today. It's just that he's working differently in the dispensation of grace compared to how he's working in Israel's prophecy program. Isn't that something? That also was just introduction, okay? So, <laughs> all right, we're going to get started now. I do want to say welcome and hi to the saints in San Juan Capistrano to my wife. She's going to be listening, right? So I called her and said, you can listen. You got to, got to, got to critique me. She said, I'll be glad to do that. So <laughs> I'm going to have you open your Bibles this evening to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 
It is interesting how Brother mentioned that he didn't assign topics. He kind of gave us all uh, speaker's choice type thing. And, and it isn't interesting how all of our topics really have dovetailed together. And the speakers tomorrow, I'm understanding, are going to be doing the same thing. Poor Des, though, he's, he showed me his notes a few minutes ago. He, he meant... These guys are way more sophisticated than I am. They, I mean, they, got, they type their notes out. They got big platform presentations and everything. And I've got a little handkerchief and something written on that. And that's <laughs> a dirty one at that, you know. And so he, he pulls out his notes because he speaks tomorrow morning. He's going to speak on 2 Timothy as well. He pulls out his notes and, you know, page after page of nice typed notes and everything, nice outline. And this note got scratched out and... Got to leave that one out because Richard mentioned that one. Oh, got to leave that one out. <laughs> Poor guy's got to do his whole no, a whole new note set tonight and everything. So, but but not really because listen, we've said these same things for years and years, haven't we? And it's because the Word of God is saying the same things and renewing our minds and reminding us about these things. So if Dean, if Dean, I'm sorry, if if Des preaches the same thing tomorrow that I preached tonight, that's probably okay, don't you think? Would that be all right? Okay, anyway. All right, let's open our Bibles this evening, if you would, over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. We're going to start actually at, um, I'm going to start at verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 6. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, now notice he says, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that Without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, excuse me, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to to the power of God. Let's unite our hearts in a word of prayer this evening. Our gracious God and Father, we're grateful that we can spend uh, some time this evening looking into your word. We're grateful really for the time we've had this weekend all together, focusing on your word, allowing your word to remind us again about the marvelous things that you are doing in this dispensation of your grace to the Gentiles. And Father, we pray that as we spend a few more minutes this evening and kind of wrap up uh, this Saturday, that the things that You took the time to have the Apostle Paul write down here that have spoken for 2,000 years now, that they would speak to us as well tonight in in our situation. And whether it is the exact predicament that we find ourselves in tonight, whatever the situation is, Father, we ask that the, the comfort, the encouragement, the challenge, the strengthening, that you designed this passage to have, not just in Timothy's life, but in our lives, that that would be a reality. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, I want to start off with an illustration. Now, by the way, my, the topic, uh, the title to my message tonight is The Spirit of Fear or the Spirit of Faith. Someone asked me, they said, well, which one is it? And I said, both. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to talk about both tonight, the spirit of fear or the spirit of faith. But I want to start out with an illustration. What season is it right now? But what season is it right now? Come on, you guys are Chicago. It's hockey season. It's Stanley Cup playoff season. What are you talking about? The game's on right now. You got those of you that, are, that have your cell phones on, you, you keep looking down instead of looking. I know what you're watching. <laughs> If, 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 we, if we hear some, some, some yeah, yeah, and, oh, if we hear that during the message and it doesn't sync with my message, you know that guy's watching the game, right? Because Chicago's got to beat Nashville tonight, right? I think they're, they're the force game six, so that's on. It's hockey season. Now, I got a question for you. Now, so those of you that are really super spiritual, I guess this one doesn't apply, but how many of y'all really like hockey? Are there any hockey fans here? Brother Jordan, Brother Jordan mentioned that, uh, that he, just in the local church right here alone, you guys could feel the... Three hockey teams. Where's poor Mike? Look at poor Mike back there. I would ask him to stand up, but that guy's in so much pain. 
When you get a chance, ask him why he's in so much pain. It wasn't because of his wife either. <laughs> All right. He was having a blast playing hockey and so forth. And it was L, L, you crushed L1, I think, or something like that, or someone did, you know. Did you even get the guy's name? Listen, it's hockey season. Okay, so, so I want to start out this message tonight with an illustration from hockey. Being from Southern California, of course, we are fans of both the Kings and the Ducks. Now, figure that one out. Okay, anyway, the Kings didn't make it in, but the Ducks did. And the Ducks were, uh, they, they uh, played Winnipeg. And, of course, they uh, swept the Winnipeg Jets in the first four games. and everything. But I want to I tell you about a situation when they went up to, uh, to Winnipeg. And, and Duck, Ducks fans are just nuts, so they're, they're just crazy out there. So at the, the Anaheim Stadium there in California, the place is just loud and noisy, this and that and everything. But they said that when they went to the stadium where the Winnipeg uh, Jets play, they, they said it was just, just way over the top, the, the, the noise level. The coach himself said that the, the, the noise itself maybe wasn't so bad, that it, it just was nonstop. It was the whole game. So I want you to get the picture. Here you've got one hockey team that is the enemy, in this case, the Ducks, right? And they've got to go fly into enemy territory. And they got to enter into the arena of the enemy. And, 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 and the Winnipeg Jets and all their fans, I don't know what the, the attendance was. It was 20, maybe 30, I don't think it was 30,000, but it was a lot of fans. It was more than two. Listen, it was like 20 or 26,000, a lot of fans. And, of course, when those ducks come on the ice, what do the, what do the Winnipeg Jets do? No, come on, come on. What, what do they do? Ah! Not, not just boo, come on. <laughs> I mean... The, 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 the ducks were entering into enemy territory. And those fans were on the side of their team. And with their energy and effort and voices and shouting, the, 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 the decibel levels go way to the top. Ear piercing. And what they were saying to the ducks, we couldn't repeat here in this audience. They were not saying how much they loved them. How excited they were that they were at their home rink. They were hurling insults at them. What was the objective? What was the purpose of the fans and that level of noise and what they were saying to the players, to the, to the, in this case the Ducks, what was the purpose of the fans doing that? Okay, intimidation, and fear, discouragement. What else? So I heard something. Distraction. You understand that? You guys that know about sports, you know what that is. One of the uh, popular players on the Ducks, his name is uh, Corey Perry. Corey Perry. Do you know anyone in the music industry that has the same last name? Katy Perry. So every time Corey was on the ice, the whole crowd would shout, and, and in unison, the whole thing, Katy Perry, Katy. That's, you understand what they're trying to do? You're trying to distract him from the game, trying to get into his mind, trying to intimidate him to get off his game so he can lose focus of what his job is to give more power and influence to their team. So they can defeat the enemy. Listen. We are the enemy as far as Satan con is concerned. We are in an arena. This present evil world. And we, we live in a world of unsaved people. That hate you. Because they are haters of God. The Bible says. Haters of God and haters one of another. And not only that, Brother Jordan talks about the fact that even the angels today are watching. So we are in this arena. And in this arena, the adversary has these various tactics that he uses to hurl insults and to intimidate and to get you and me off of our game. How often do you hear after, after a game and they interview the players and, they, and maybe it was a team that lost and they say, man, they just got us off our game. Or the team that won, they said, well, we just had to stick with our game. 
Paul, in the scripture, the Holy Spirit had the Apostle Paul write down in scripture exactly the intimidation tactics that the adversary uses to get us off our game. Okay, so that's the illustration. So keep that in mind as we go through this message. Now, a little bit of background here about Timothy. I'm going to have you go to 1 Timothy chapter number 1 here, real quickly. We're going to, we're going to set this up real quickly because you guys already know this. If not, it's, that, that's okay. You can go back and look at the verses and that type of thing. The, the Apostle Paul, you can see in 1 Timothy chapter number 1 at verse 3, he says this, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, he says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou might charge some, that thou mightest charge some to teach no other doctrine. Now, why would the Apostle Paul have to instruct Timothy to charge some that they teach no other doctrine? What obviously was happening at Ephesus? People were teaching other doctrine. Doctrine other than what doctrine? Jump in the same context. Look down at verse 11. I'm actually, verse 10. Watch this. He says, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for, 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 li- uh, for liars, for perjured persons. Watch this. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to what? What's that verse say there? According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. God, the Holy Spirit, right there in your Bible, defined what he meant by sound doctrine. Any doctrine today in the dispensation of grace that does not match the doctrine that Paul taught is not sound doctrine. So when he tells Timothy here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 at verse 3, you can see he says, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. Obviously, there was an opposing doctrine. There was a, there was a doctrine being promoted at Ephesus that was a counter to what Timothy was preaching. That doctrine was a doctrine that said, oh, we believe in God. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the resurrection. It's just there's some things you got to do to get all that. You see, they were perverting the right gospel. And you see it in the context here. Look at verse 4. He says, "Uh, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. Here it is now. Watch this very carefully. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the New Age movement. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Desiring to be teachers of Eastern mysticism. No, no. Desiring to be teachers of Islam. What does that verse say? That verse says they were desiring to be teachers of the law. Where do you get the law from? You get the law from Scripture. You get the law from the Bible. These people that Paul left Timothy there at Ephesus to, to, to charge them to teach no other doctrine, they were teaching the Bible. They were using God's words. They were not going to some other source. They were using Scripture. But it was the Word of God wrongly divided. They were taking the information that God gave to the nation of Israel for their program. And they were teaching that as though that was the information that you and me are supposed to be, you and I are supposed to be following today. Did you say that in the verse there? So, the, the no other doctrine in that verse is identified for you as those who were leaving what Paul was teaching, desiring to be teachers of the law. What does that look like today? How does it appear today? How would you know it if you were sitting under the ministry of someone and they were doing that, but that verse warned about? How would you know it? Listen, not everyone that names the name of Jesus Not everyone that talks about God from the pulpit. Not everyone that mentions the Holy Spirit from the pulpit is preaching the right gospel. Nor are they preaching the word of God rightly divided. It takes some spiritual discernment. And again I say, that if the gospel that is coming from that pulpit, from that radio, from that book that you are studying, from that television program that you are listening to, If it doesn't match Paul's gospel, it is not the gospel. If it doesn't match the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, 
and yet it's biblical, it's scriptural, then what's happening is exactly what that verse told Timothy to be aware of. So the Apostle Paul left Timothy right, right there at Ephesus to, 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 in, in the battle. He equips Timothy in this book as to not only how to save himself from the apostasy, how to also equip those that would listen to him. In fact, you think about 1 Timothy, and there's so much in 1 Timothy about making sure about how, how the uh, local assembly is supposed to be organized. He talks about the deacons, the elders, the beast, bishops, things like that. He also tells Timothy things like this. Look over to 1 Timothy 4. Look over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Watch verse 6. Look at verse 6. He says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Well, what things? The things about how God is working in the dispensation of grace. He says this. He says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. I have a question for you this evening. Those of you that are either in the ministry or want to be in the ministry or want to have an impact on other people's lives by teaching in the Word of God. Is there an objective standard that you can go to to measure your ministry against to see whether or not you are a, quote-unquote, good minister of Jesus Christ. Is there? Yes or no? Where is it? Where is it? We, we just read the verse. It's right there in black and white. There is an absolute objective standard. You do not have to wait till you get to the judgment seat of Christ to find out whether or not you have been a good minister of Jesus Christ. That verse tells you. It tells you how you can know right now and what you should do, what you should be preaching in order to know with confidence, not self-confidence, but with confidence in God's word. That God says, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, then you, will be, you are a good minister of Jesus Christ. So imagine when Timothy got this document and he's reading it. You know, he was a little discouraged at the time because things weren't going so well. By the way, wait till we get to 2 Timothy here in about five more minutes, okay? So Timothy probably took a little bit of encouragement from that. He said, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm preaching the right message, so let, let me just stay at it then, because God's evaluation of it is, a, I'm, I'm a good minister, so I'm, so I'm doing what he wants me to do. And by faith, he could believe that, right? In this same context, he tells Timothy as well. He says, do this, Timothy. Jump down a little bit further ahead. Look at verse 14. I'm leaving a lot of verses out just because of time's sake and that kind of thing. You can go back and fill in the details. But notice what he also says at verse 14. He says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. So what is he supposed to do with that information that, that is inside of him? What's he, supposed to, what's he supposed to not do with it? So let me ask you this. If you neglect something, what does that mean? To, to neglect something is to, what's that? Yeah, it lays out. You don't use it. You kind of you take it for granted. You get to it when you can. So if he says, neglect not... Well, what's part of the struggle that Timothy's going to have then? What's part of the struggle, preachers, that we're going to have to, that we do face on a regular basis? That very verse. Neglect not that. Make sure and give some time. Look at what else he says. He says in verse 15, he says, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself. Timothy, you've got to watch out for yourself. How many of you in ministry... I know as strange as this might sound, and I don't mean to ask this question in a self-centered way, but how many of you pray for yourself? How many of you watch out for yourself? That verse says right there, take heed unto thy Timothy, you, you, you better, you got to watch out for yourself. Not to the exclusion of others, but to the benefit of others. He says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself. Save thyself from what? From apostasy, the departure. And he says, and them that... What's the, what's the word? Here. Faith cometh by, and hearing by 
They said, Timothy, you're going to be preaching to the saints there at Ephesus. Some have already departed. I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute. But listen, Timothy, those that hear you, those that, 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 that take what you say and allow it to get into their inner man, it will save them from the apostasy. So that also would be an encouragement to Timothy, don't you think? On the one hand, now he's got an objective standard to evaluate whether or not he's preaching what God wants to be taught and so forth. But he also has an objective standard as to how to know whether or not he's, giving, whether or not he's feeding the proper spiritual food to the local assembly that's going to equip them from the apostasy. See that? He's got objective standards now. When Paul writes 1 Timothy, look over what he says. I'm going to watch this. Look over to 1 Timothy 1. When Paul writes 1 Timothy, the departure had started. An apostasy had started, but at this point, it's, it's only some. Look, he says at, 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 at 1 6, 1 Timothy 1 6, he says, from which, what's the next word there? Some having swerved. Look at 1 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which, what's the next word there? Some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Look at chapter 5. I'm going to come back to chapter 4 momentarily. Look at chapter 5, verse 15. 5.15. What does that say there? For what? For some already turned aside after Satan. Look at chapter 5. But by the way, that, that context there is, is uh, look down a little bit further ahead. Look at chapter 6 real quick. Chapter 6. You can see at verse 5, he says, perverse disputing of men's corrupt minds are just dis- through the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from, uh, from such withdraw thyself. And he talks about that the people are, are using the wrong standard there, and then they, so, they, so they depart. Look in the same chapter, this time, uh, look at verse 10. He says, for the love of money. is, the, And they were connecting gain with money. So as their churches were growing and the income was increasing and the budgets were getting bigger, Therefore, that meant God was blessing. And he says at verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred. from the, They were using the wrong standard to determine, quote-unquote, God's blessing. In the same chapter, notice he, in, in the context of science, uh, falsely so-called, verse 20, verse 21, he says, Which some professing have erred. Concern. See how all through the book of, of First Timothy, it's some have departed, some have departed. And they left because of this issue, because of that issue, because of this issue, and so forth. Well, watch this in chapter 4 very quickly of what he says here. He says, Timothy, listen, this battle's not over yet. It's just going to intensify. It's going to get worse. He says, First Timothy 4, 1, he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, what's it say there? Some shall depart from what? Listen, those, when he says depart from the faith, you can't depart from the faith unless you're in the faith. You can't depart from Chicago unless you're in Chicago. You can't depart from Florida unless you're in Florida. You can't depart from California unless you're in... The the warning there is not a warning about... Just the general concept that fewer people are going to believe in God and they're going to become atheists. He's talking about people who were in the faith. And then they left it. He is talking about people who came to see and believe Paul's gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And then they leave it. Have you ever asked yourself that question? That Man, how could, how could that ever happen? That verse tells you it not only can, can happen, it, it did happen. What else does that tell us? It still can. To whom? To me. And to you. And to Timothy. That's why I told Timothy, he says, listen, Timothy, you need to take heed to yourself because you take heed to yourself and the doctrine, because in doing so, you'll save yourself from the tactic of the adversary to come along and intimidate you to where you decide the battle is just no longer worth it. Let me just go back to my illustration about Stanley Cup here for a moment. I'm going to try to do this a few times throughout the message. They say that one of the greatest battles involved in, greatest struggles involved in making it all the way to the final game. It's a mental battle. 
a mental battle of the toughness. Because those guys, they just beat each other up against the boards. Mike, how are you feeling tonight? Yeah, just so-so, he said. And he wasn't even playing for Stanley Cup. Well, maybe they were playing for the local Stanley Cup. I don't know. But they say game after game after game, just the absolute physical torture of the being checked into the boards and hacked with the sticks and tripped and you know, punched and so forth. And then just the mental awareness that I got to go through this for like, 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 you know, four more series and so forth. And what if each of those series goes to the full seven games? You know, by the time last year the Kings won the Stanley Cup, they went full seven games each series. And they say, just, just get in your mind around that. The willingness to put up with the pain that you know you're going to get inflicted upon you by the enemy. And yet you're willing to go all the way to the end. Isn't that something? When Paul is writing to Timothy here, he says, Timothy, listen, some have departed. Some left for this reason. Some left for that, that reason. And it's just going to get worse. Now go to 2 Timothy. Watch this now. Shortly after he writes 1 Timothy, the need became very aware to the Apostle Paul that Timothy needed some more instruction. That great apostasy that the Apostle Paul warned about, that the Holy Spirit himself said, spoke expressly about, that great apostasy, It swept like a tidal wave, like a tsunami across Asia. And he says at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia, he turned away from me. See that verse there? I had someone email me one time in relationship to that verse, and we were trying to show them, Paul's ministry message, and their reply back was, well, well, so what? Who cares if they left Paul? There's there's nothing significant about that. Paul's just kind of got a complex here. Now, wait a minute. When when Paul says, all they were in Asia be turned away from me, if you've read Paul's epistles, does he have a complex? Is he narcissistic? Is everything about him? I don't think so. If if it was, why would he put up with the level of beatings and torture on a repeated basis that he wrote about, that Brother Jordan read about the other day, yesterday, over in 2 Corinthians? And that was even just through the early part of his ministry. And it continued. Why would he put up with that? When he says, all the earth in Asia be turned away from me. He's saying they turned away from what? Listen, you turn away from the Apostle Paul, and you are turning away from the doctrine the Apostle Paul taught, and you turn away from the doctrine the Apostle Paul taught, you are turning away from the person who gave him that doctrine, and that's our risen and ascended Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what that verse is talking about. He says, man, they've all turned away from me. They've left the doctrine. And, And you'll notice that he says there in that verse, look at verse 15, Verse 15 again, he says, this thou knowest. Timothy knew this. Okay, now wait a minute then. At the time Paul gets 1 Timothy, you know, he's a little discouraged and he reads that book and he he gets from 1 Timothy information that's designed to encourage him, build him up and tell him what to do and how to equip himself, how to equip the saints and so forth. And the warning, listen, this, 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 this apostasy is coming. So, Timothy, if you want to be a good minister of Jesus Christ, then just keep preaching this message. Don't don't allow the adversary to to get you sidetracked. And you just keep preaching because those that hear you, they take on board what you're teaching, they'll also be saved from the apostasy, but no one else will. But when that apostasy came and took with it all the mature of Asia, who was in Asia? Who, Who were they? The Ephesians. Keep going. The Colossians. Who else? No, not the Galatians. The Laodiceans. The Galatians, by the way, had left long before this, remember? 
long before this, and the Corinthians barely got even started. About the only ones that seemed to stay with the doctrine were the Thessalonians and the Philippians. Isn't that fascinating? And the Philippians and Thessalonians, they were up in Macedonia, not in Asia. And so Timothy, he witnessed firsthand the great departure, the great apostasy of the, the body of Christ. You ever read the book of Jeremiah? You ever read Lamentations? It's no wonder they call him the weeping prophet. Because he, he not only predicted the great apostasy of the nation and the, the, the resulting departure and the captivities and so forth, he, he, he saw it happen in his lifetime and he wept over it. And you kind of wonder if in parallel here, as Timothy sees this great apostasy sweeping across Asia, that was his local assembly. These are people he, he, he sat down and ministered to and prayed with and went out to lunch with and, and maybe you'd married some couples and, and, and had to give some funeral service for some others. These are people he knew and they left the doctrine. Now what does Timothy start doing? Timothy begins to look at the circumstances, i.e. listening to the crowd, and the taunting, and the level of the noise, and the intensity of the battle. And he begins to use the wrong standard to evaluate why they left. And he begins to blame himself. I must not have been a good minister of Jesus Christ. Guys, I got a question for you. If you ever find yourself asking yourself that question, and it's a valid question to ask, not in the sense of condemning, but if you ever ask yourself that question, am I a good minister of Jesus Christ? What's the natural default answer you give to that? It's probably no. And then as you answer no, now what happens? Gee. Oh, what do I got to do now? Now, now, you, now? now all of a sudden your flesh wants to start performing to become a good minister. And, and so you try harder and you try better. And you try more. And it doesn't seem to be working. No more people are coming. And those that do come, you seem to scare them away. Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll try more. And that message that Brother Jordan preached earlier today about, listen, we, we got to get over ourselves. we got to get over trying to do this in the energy of our flesh. Because it will never happen that way. And we'll put ourselves right back under the law while preaching grace. We won't be even listening to our own preaching. Timothy was using the wrong standard to evaluate why, not so much why, the false teaching was out there, but why everybody fell for it. And he began to blame himself. Look at how it impacted him. Watch this. Look at verse 3 again. This time I'm back at First Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 1 3. He says this I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Now watch, watch Paul, verse 4. He says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of what? Of thy tears. Paul is in bonds at Rome. Timothy's way over in Asia at Ephesus. How did word get back to Paul in Rome in prison? Timothy was broken down in tears. Someone must have, must have seen that and got word back to Paul. Paul is in bonds. You'd think if anyone should be in tears and burdened, Paul, and yet is what the burden on Paul was how much Paul how, how much Paul was concerned about Timothy's spiritual well-being because he knew Timothy now was down. And in tears. Timothy was blaming himself for the quote-unquote apparent failure. 
at Ephesus and throughout Asia. He was using the wrong standard. What's, what, not only was Timothy in tears. Look at verse 5. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. Why would Paul have to bring that up? Listen, watch this, watch this. Make, hold that verse here. Come back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, number 1. Watch this now. Remember Paul said that the, there's the goal of the doctrine that you are to preach. There's a goal that's going to produce something in your life. Something. Look at verse, so I'm back at 1 Timothy 1. I'm at verse 5. He says, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith. What? What's it say there? What, what does the word feign mean? Okay, so what, what would unfeign mean? It's genuine, it's real. Sound doctrine will produce unfeigned faith in those that believe it. It will do that. So now go back with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. So when the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and the mother Eunice. Now watch this. And I am persuaded that in thee also. Do you realize what, that, what Paul's saying to Timothy? He's saying, listen, Timothy, I realize you are doubting that you believe this, but I don't doubt that you did believe this. Timothy was questioning whether or not he really believed the doctrine. Because after all, if he really did believe the doctrine, and he was a good minister of Jesus Christ, then these people wouldn't have left. So it must have been his fault. Therefore, did he really believe this? Or was it just a show? You see what Paul's saying there? He says, Timothy, I know this dwelt in you. Not only that, he says this. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee. It, it, how did Paul know it was in him? Because he says, by the putting on my hands. Timothy was even doubting whether the doctrine was in him anymore. Isn't that incredible? You get the sense that Timothy's down. He's off his game. He's let the circumstances get into his inner man, his mind, into his heart, and just, just crush him down where he is in tears. He's in doubt. He's questioning whether or not the doctrine actually could work. I'm going to jump ahead from, from verse 7 to verse 8. I'm going to come back to verse 7 in a moment. Look at verse 8. He says, be not thou therefore what? Timothy had become ashamed. Ashamed of what? Paul mentions two things there. He says, be not thou therefore ashamed of... No, here's the first one. The testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. Timothy had actually become ashamed of the message that Christ gave to Paul, the word of God rightly divided. Oh, you guys talk about right division too much. There are more verses in the Bible than 2 Timothy 2.15. You guys are just right dividers. You guys not only split the Bible up, you split churches up. Get off your right division high horse. There's a whole bunch of verses in the Bible besides 2 Timothy 2.15. You guys spend so much time riding that horse, you're not getting anywhere. Quit preaching it. You hear that often enough. By the way, you do hear those kinds of things, don't you? That's all designed to get you to become ashamed of the message. Just don't preach it so hard. You kind of come across John too intense. Just calm down a little bit. I'm trying to over the years, by the way. <laughs> not with the doctrine. Just, just settle down. You drive people away. You, you want to grow your churches, you've got to just calm down a little bit. Don't, don't, don't preach it like it's the only truth that's there. Okay, so I'll preach it like it's a lie? No, no, I'm just, 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 you know, just kind of calming down. Listen, Timothy began to question the doctrine when he saw the circumstances and then 
he began to back off a little bit from the message, thinking, well, maybe the way I was trying, it wasn't working. Maybe I should just change it just a little bit to modernize it, upgrade it, new, new and improved it. And he says there, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. That's the testimony that Jesus Christ gave to the Apostle Paul. Not the testimony Christ gave to the twelve apostles. They had their message. They did a fine job with that, but that's not what that verse is talking about. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And he says, Nor of me. His what? His what? You mean the guy that you studied from, the guy you got your degree from, the guy that you're following is in jail? My pastor went to this seminary. My pastor went to this school. My pastor went to this, you know, got his doctorate over here. Your your, your mentor freely says he's just a prisoner. Do you understand? You follow what I'm saying? I'm being a little sarcastic here, but I'm trying to emphasize the point here. Listen, all the things that are said out there that are designed to the little the ministry Christ gave to Paul by belittling Paul and just making him one of the twelve. He's just preaching the same things the other apostles are preaching. It's all the same information. There is no difference about it. So you guys are making way too much of Paul. Why would God the Holy Spirit have the apostle Paul write, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner? Why would he have him add that? Because there is a direct connection between your conviction and belief of the message Christ gave to Paul and your willingness to uphold Paul's apostleship. You abandoned Paul's apostleship and you will abandon the message. Let me have you see this as an example. Go with me over to 2 Corinthians. Look over to 2 Corinthians. And I'm going to have you look over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Pardon me. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, of course, the Apostle Paul is conveying and reminding the Corinthians of the fact about how he got the information directly from the Lord and so forth. But and we're not going to go through all that. I just want to watch what he says here. Look at verse 11. He says, I am become a fool in glory. Everybody with me there? Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Think about that phrase when he says, for I ought to have been commended of you. How many instructors did the Corinthians have? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, how many? He says, though you have, how many? 10,000. The Corinthians were sitting under the ministry of these 10,000 instructors. And this information that these 10,000 instructors were conveying to the Corinthians had gotten to their hearts. And it was crowding out of their hearts any room for Pauline doctrine. Paul says, you are not constrained in us. You are constrained in your own bowels. He says, the room that you used to have in your heart, in your bowels, in, 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 the, in the innermost parts of your being, where you love me and you, you love the doctor. He says, that, that room is, it, you've got all this other stuff in there and you've moved my stuff out. Remember the book of Ezekiel. How God is explaining through Ezekiel why they're going to go off to captivity and so forth. And he says, do you, you see the idols that they've set up? And that one idol right there, and it's sitting at the door of my house that I 
have to leave this place. God had to leave his own house because his own nation opened their arms and their heart to the idol. God says that I have to leave my own house. You see the parallel here? Paul says, you guys are not straightening us. He says, I got plenty of room in my heart for you, but you're straightening your own vows. That false doctrine that you're getting from those 10,000 instructors has, 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 has caused you guys to press out of your heart all, all what I've been teaching you. And of course, in 2 Corinthians, he seeks to get them back on track, and they seem to have responded, by the way. And then in this verse, he says this. Remember at verse 11, he says, For I ought to have been commended of you. You know what the Corinthians should have done? When those 10,000 came in, when those 10,000 instructors began to seek the pulpits at Corinth and the various churches and local assemblies at Corinth, and they, began to, and they began to belittle Paul's message and so forth and just make Paul one of the twelve and make his message no different than any other message and so forth. You know what those Corinthians should have done? They should have stood up for the Apostle Paul and said, you guys get out of this pulpit. They should have commended the Apostle Paul, not gone along with these teachers who tore him down. Do you see that verse? That's why when Paul says, he says, Timothy, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Watch something else here. We're still going to come back in a moment here to verse, uh, to verse 7. Watch something else that he says here. I'm going to jump down to verse 16, if you would. Verse 16 says this. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. For he oft refreshed me. Now watch this now. Watch, 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 watch this now. And was not ashamed of what? When he says my chain, what does he mean? He's in bonds for what he's preaching. So when he says he was not ashamed of my chain, what evidently had everybody else become? Ashamed of being associated with the Apostle Paul and the reason for which he was in bonds. Keep reading. Look what he says. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out. Next two words there. Wait, to, to seek someone out very diligently and find them. What, what is implied in that? What, what's that? What's it? He had to hunt for him. Listen, at a time when it was dangerous to be associated with the Apostle Paul. Onesimus I'm sorry, Onesiphorus. He sought him out very diligently, realizing he was putting his own life on the line, his own neck on the line when he did that. When he ran around Rome asking, hey, tell me where I can find this guy in, in prison. The Apostle Paul, where is he at? Don't you know some of the crowd pulled away from Paul? Others said, quick, tell the Romans that this guy's looking for this prisoner. Maybe he's one of his crowd. He says, he was not ashamed of my chains. He sought me out very diligently, you know what? And found me. There is an unbelievably powerful spiritual lesson in that principle right there. Don't be ashamed of the Apostle Paul. If you seek out very diligently what God is doing in the dispensation of grace as taught by Christ to the Apostle Paul, you will find the message. You will find it. But it will take diligent search. I had a young guy at a Bible study. This was probably five, six months ago. Now, and they were very new to the grace message. We just started a Bible study trying to teach some guys some grace message and so forth. Knew nothing about it. And after several weeks, the guy made the comment. And this guy, there was a genuine comment, really good comment and so forth. It, it, was, it was made from a, gen, a, a right heart. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, he said, he said this. He said, you know, I don't think I would have seen this message if you didn't teach me this message. So therefore... Is it legitimate? And it, he was asking it from a sincere heart, not, not a heart fighting it. And I said, well, that's a good question. It's a valid question. How would you know? How do you know? Is it legitimate that you've come to see some of these things by someone teaching you these things? Is that legitimate? I'm, I'm asking you, by the way. Why do you say yes? Yeah, listen. The Apostle Paul had to teach the Galatians. He had to teach the Corinthians. He had to teach the Romans and so forth. 
remember the, the question, speakest thou the prophet of himself or of some other man? And he says, how, how do I know? Except some man should guide me. You got someone guide you. That verse says that Onesiphorus, he sought me out very diligently. You seek out diligently what Paul taught, and you will find it. Isn't that wonderful? Think about that. Now, Timothy, he's discouraged. He's down. He's in tears, doubting whether or not he believed the message himself. Becoming ashamed of the message in the apostle. It, it, interesting, because you, you know, maybe we didn't think Timothy would do something like that. Timothy's been with Paul at least 25 years by this point. You know the first time the Apostle Paul was exposed? I'm sorry, the first time Timothy was exposed to Paul? Way back on Paul's first apostolic journey. Acts 13 and 14 in particular. What happened to Paul at Lystra and Derby and Iconium in Acts 14? They, they had a rock party in his honor. And he was at the bottom of the pile. Timothy saw that. By the time Paul starts his second apostolic journey, Acts, the, right the last verse of chapter 15, first verse of chapter 16 of Acts, Timothy is already a disciple. He's already well known to the brethren. He, he saw what the apostle Paul went through and experienced and so forth at Paul's first apostolic journey. That had an impact on his grandmother, on his mother, and bang on him as well. So by the time Paul starts his second apostolic journey, Timothy's already a, a disciple, he's already a believer. All the way back to that event. It's no wonder as Paul is seeking to encourage Timothy to get back in the battle, get back in the fight, quit listening to the audience. Quit using the wrong standard to evaluate why the apostasy happened and why they left. It's not what you did or didn't do. He says, Timothy, you remember some things. What? Go, go, go to chapter 3. Go to chapter 3. Watch what he says. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. He says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Now watch this now. Persecutions, afflictions, which came to me where? And I called him and listen. You know what that is? That's Acts 14. That's when Tim Timothy was just a young boy and probably was just, just terrified by what he saw happen to this man. And yet he heard this man preach some things that sounded wonderful. He takes Timothy's thinking all the way back to when he first saw this man as a means of restabilizing Timothy. Getting his mind back on track. Go back to chapter 1. He tells Timothy here. He tells Timothy at verse, at verse 7. He says, listen, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. So what else had gripped Timothy? What, what had gripped, in that verse right there, what had gripped him? The spirit of what? The spirit of fear. Have you ever been afraid? I mean really afraid. I mean, really afraid. <laughs> did did, did y'all ever, did y'all ever, anybody here ever see the, the series Star Wars? Yeah, some of them to me. I think it was the first Star Wars, and of course, of course, Luke is being trained by the little monkey guy, Yoda, whatever his name is. And of course, they're out there in the woods somewhere and training everything. And, and Luke says back to Yoda, and he says, I'm not afraid of anything, you know? And Yoda looks him in the face and says, Oh, you will be, you will be. Remember that scene? And, of course, several things happen and so forth. And he does. Fear just grips Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Listen, that fear was real. And it came and it gripped Timothy. And it held him in a petrified status. Did you notice that Paul said, verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. 
You know what that means, therefore? That means the Apostle Paul also personally had to struggle with and battle with the spirit of fear. Are you familiar with 2 Corinthians? Turn there with me if you would to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. Look at 2 Corinthians 7, 5. You, know, you all know this verse. 2 Corinthians 7, 5. He says, For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, and within were fear. Let me ask you to think about a situation. Have you ever gone an extended period of your life where you get no sleep? Doesn't that in and of itself just wear you down? You know, researchers and scientists are discovering something that people kind of knew all along. You, you need to get decent sleep every day. But how many of us do? And it, it, Paul talks about we had, had no rest in our flesh. He makes that trip for, across Troas, across to Macedonia... And he is just physically exhausted. And it is a whole lot more difficult to keep your spirits up when you are physically drained. Those of you that struggle with health issues. Um, anybody here? Probably almost everyone. And you have those health issues and they just don't seem to go away. And it just weighs down on you, the pain in your back, your hips. It's just always there. You try to take something forward, it doesn't seem to get any better. And it just weighs on you, does it not? Now multiply that and add to it. He says... We had no, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. And then add on top of that, without were fightings. And now add on top of that, within were fears. It's no wonder Paul could write so personally about that spirit of fear. And say, and identify Timothy as my Dearly beloved. Because that's how he identifies him in 2 Timothy, not 1 Timothy. Because he could relate to what Timothy was going through in that spirit of fear that he had to battle himself. Now, are we all depressed? <laughs> are we all discouraged now? Okay, I'm done. Let's close in prayer. No. <laughs> Can't stop here, right? Paul's going to go on and say here in 2 Timothy, he's going to say, hey, Timothy, you know what else? Look over to 2 Timothy 3.1. He says, oh, Timothy, listen, a couple of other important pieces of the puzzle here. He says this now also that in the last days, okay, perilous times are going to come. Not only that, Timothy, look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. He says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Oh, hey, Timothy, you know what? It's really bad. You're blaming yourself. Well, you know what? You know what? It's going to get worse. And not only that, Timothy, look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, he says at verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Hey, I'm out of here. Good luck. Have fun. I'll see you in heaven. It's going to be so wonderful to be there. I'll be up there thinking about you. Have a blast down here. Oh, and not only that, Timothy, look at chapter 4. What you, look what he says. Look at, look at chapter 4, verse 5. 4, 5, he says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of... Next two words there. He turns the whole shipwreck over to Timothy and says, Hey, try to make this thing float. You understand what he's doing there? Man. You know, if it was me, it's like, Okay, Lord, I'm ready to go with Paul. <laughs> Put me in the same jail with him. I'm out of here. This thing hasn't got a chance of floating, a chance of working. We lost the game. The crowd intimidated us. They won. We're out of here. 
But you and I know that isn't what Paul says. What does he say? He says, Timothy, God, God's not given us that spirit of fear. Timothy, that spirit of fear that has gripped you, I know about it personally. That, that allowing yourself to be intimidated, that intention of the adversary to intimidate you to become ashamed, I had to deal with that same battle. Remember Philippians chapter number 1? That in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. Timothy, I faced the same intimidation tactic of the adversary. And the only thing that sustained me was the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ working in me. Nothing else will work. Everything else is just a mask. It's a, just a temporary fix. He says, God, he says, Timothy, that spirit of fear, that didn't come from God. But ample provision did come from God. Everything you need did come from God. And he puts it, at least initially in this verse, in three categories. What are the three? Power, next one. Love. And what? Next one. I say on mine. What is the power? What's the provision that God has left for you and me today to depend on, to trust on, to let it work in us? What is the power? It's the Word of God. That's what God has left us with. Let me ask you a question. How powerful is God's Word? Let me ask a different question to try to answer that question. When you trusted Jesus Christ for your Savior, just for a moment now, think of all the things that happened to you in a moment of time, most of which you didn't even know happened to you. Let's just kind of go down through the list here. Well, you got taken out of Adam into Christ. The Holy Spirit took and, and, and baptized you into the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, an event that happened 2,000 years ago, by the way, intervention. <laughs> you, you, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You could never get out. You were forgiven of all of your sins, past, present, and future. You were raised up with Christ and set with Him in heavenly places. You were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You were delivered from the power of darkness, translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. You were made accepted in the beloved. You're made an heir of God and, yes, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And those are just a few. I got a question. What kind of resource, what kind of energy, what kind of power was that effective? It was God's Word did that. If God's Word could do that for me and you in a moment of time when you believe the gospel, then it is the power that is able to sustain us in the midst of the battle. The spirit of power that God gave us is His book, His Word. And it's His Word rightly divided. You, listen, there is no power today. You go and put the believers under the law. Understand that? You're delivered from the law that you might live unto God, Galatians says. What about this spirit, of, oh, this spirit of fear? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. What, what, is the, what is love? What is the spirit of love? Doesn't the Apostle Paul say, the love of Christ does what? It constraineth us. He says, faith worketh by what? And then he says, by love serve. Listen, that spirit of love, that's the motivation of grace. Question. 
those hockey players, why are they willing to put up with such, you know, being bruised and beat up and tortured through these games? Why? What's the goal? The Stanley Cup. They call it the, the world's most powerful, precious trophy, known all over the world. They go through all that to obtain a, as Paul would say, a corruptible crown, a perishable crown. But what's the motivation? Because there is motivation there. It's the prize. It's, that, it's, that, it's the Stanley Cup. It's getting our names on the cup. It's drinking beer out of the cup. It's going swimming with the cup. All the crazy things to do with the cup, man. <laughs> what a goal in life, you know. My goal in life is to drink beer out of the Stanley Cup. Not, you, not really. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. That's not really my goal, okay? <laughs> Some of y'all, I think, took, my, took me serious on that one. No, 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 no. I'm making a comparison here. The, the motivation for the Apostle Paul is not the Stanley Cup. The motivation is love. The spirit of love. God commended his love toward us. If the love of God was powerful enough to move God to spare not his own son, and if the love of God was powerful enough to cause the son to say, Father, let's get on with the program. Let's take this thing to the end and see it through. If the love of God was that powerful, then it must be the most powerful motivator in the entire universe. That's the spirit that God has given to us. And how about the spirit of a sound mind? What's a sound mind? Well, what's sound doctrine? What's sound doctrine? The message Christ gave to Paul. So if sound doctrine is a reference to the, to the doctrine Christ gave to Paul, what would a sound mind be? There you go. It's putting that doctrine in your thinking and then functioning on that thinking. A mind that's fortified with sound doctrine. A mind that's, that's stabilized with sound doctrine. A mind that's filled with sound doctrine. A mind that is filled with how God thinks. Now put all this together. Timothy looked at the circumstances. Hence, he was using the wrong standard to evaluate what happened and why it happened. And because he was using the wrong standard and therefore judging things wrong, he became very discouraged, in tears, doubting whether or not he believed this, doubting whether or not the doctrine works. He became ashamed of the message. He was absolutely in the grips of the spirit of what does Paul say to him? He says, listen, to remember, that thing that grips you right now, that didn't come from the message I taught you. That didn't come from God. It didn't come from His Word. Here's the Word of God. It's the power. It's the resource. It tells you about all who you are in Christ, all that God made you to be in Christ, all that He's doing. Here's the cross of Christ that manifests the motivation of grace, the love of God. Now, Timothy, take and put that back into your thinking. Timothy, I know it's in you. I know that unfaith is in those unfaith faith. I know it's in you. So just, just bring it back up. Re, you know, on your computer, you used to have a reset button. Timothy, hit the reset button. <laughs> and then do this. Get back on your game. Timothy, the first period's over, and we got our you-know-what's kicked. And the second period's over, and... It's even worse. And we're halfway through the third period, but the game's not over yet. Like Brother Jordan said, it's always too soon to quit. Why? How come it's always too soon to quit? Because it's not over yet. Don't you get excited when you watch the hockey game and your team wins with 13 seconds left like the Ducks did against Winnipeg? The place went nuts. Paul is saying to Timothy, the game's not over yet. That final whistle and buzzer is not going to sound until you hear the shout. So, Timothy, be not, look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. Let's try to wrap this up here. Look at verse 8. 
You notice I did say try. Anyway, verse 8. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me as prisoner. Now watch this. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of what? I'm in 2 Timothy 1.8. 2 Timothy 1.8. He says, But be thou partaker of the afflictions of what? Timothy realized that if you're going to preach this message, there are afflictions associated with the message. So make a choice to be a partaker. Get back, pick your stick up, pick your gloves back up, put your helmet back on, go find the puck. Think this. When the other team has the puck, you need to think in your mind, what are you doing with my puck? That belongs to me and my team. And it goes into your net. You've you got to think differently, Timothy, about, about what we're doing here. And he says this. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to what? There's the standard. Once again, what is the power of God? What, what is it? It's the word of God, rightly divided, right? Romans 1.16, the gospel of Christ, it, it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross is the power of God. The Word of God works effectually in you that, what? Believe. So says Timothy, get back in the fight. Pick your hockey stick back up. Let's go. But Timothy, you've got to remember this. Do so. Not according to your own ability, your own reasoning, your own strength. Timothy, you yourself see that won't do. You're in tears. You're down. You're discouraged. You're beat up. You, 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 for all practical purposes, have quit. You, you acknowledge, you see firsthand your flesh can't and won't do it. But get back in the fight, Timothy. You know why? Because God has given us a spirit of power and love and of a summer. He's given us the equipment. He's given us the provisions, the word, the motivation, and how to think. So you get back into the fight, Timothy. But do so according to the power of God. According to God's word and the ability of God's word to sustain you, to equip you, and to help you get through all the way until either death or the rapture. Yeah, <laughs> tell, the, tell, the, tell the shout happens, right? Wait, wait, Timmy, just get back into this thing. Well, do you guys like hockey? Hockey is a game. It's a pretty exciting game. Some of y'all don't like hockey, but it's a pretty fun game. You see the intensity of the players. You see the intensity of the fans are nuts, man. <laughs> I mean, they paint their faces. They wear funny costumes. They do, you know, Laura and I sometimes will watch that. You, you'll see grown-ups are just acting like total... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and we'll both comment that, you know, they're, they're, if their kids are watching them, they're saying, I do not know this adult sitting next to me, you know. <laughs> but listen, hockey's a game. This is real life. Hockey's something you can go to and you can cheer for your team, be excited when they score and win, or be discouraged when they lose and fail. But, you know, you get over it. This we're talking about, this is not a game. This is real. This is life. Life is the opportunity to be a partaker. We, we say, Lord, help us to do that. that. That is the only thing you can say. Because we cannot do it out of our own energy and strength. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we can spend a little bit of time this evening looking at Timothy and his situation and, and kind of relating it to things that, that we can kind of relate to just in the world out there and not in any way God intending to belittle or make light of your word, but certainly to illustrate the seriousness of, of how you take this and therefore of the battle that we are involved in and that you have not less left us unequipped or ill-equipped or anything like that. We thank you for your precious and holy word. God, I thank you for all these saints here. It is so good to see them people that sometimes we don't see but once every several years. God, we all collectively say thank you to you 
for your love, for the opportunity to gather here, to have our hearts and our minds renewed again and encouraged again by just what you say out of your love for us through a pen of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.